Hello and uh, welcome to our discussion and I'm really glad um, to have you all here today. Um, and since many people have many different events every day, let's just get started. Uh, my name is Sabine Muscat. Um, I run the program for technology and digital policy at the Heinrich Böll Foundation's Washington DC office. And we're very proud, proud to co-host this event with Connectif. And uh, Connectif is an agency in Berlin that advises um, public sector institutions on um, international development in the ICT sector. And we will hear from its founder, Geraldine de Bastion, in a bit. And the Heinrich Böll Foundation is a nonprofit organization um, that's part of the global green movement. Um, we are headquartered in Berlin, but we have more than 30 offices around the world. And I'm especially proud today that um, all of the countries that our speakers come from, are uh, rep we are represented in the, all those countries, in Germany, Brazil, uh, Kenya, and India, and of course here in DC. Um, this uh, today's event is part of our ongoing project uh, data and development, which is a collaboration between my program and the program for infrastructure and development, which is run by uh, Christine Schweisgut. And our, at our Washington DC office, we run uh, global and transatlantic dialogue programs and we work to shape multilateral processes and norms. And we focus on issues ranging from civil, liber civil liberties and democracy to social justice and <coughs> change. Translated to digital issues, that means we work towards securing an inclusive, rights-based, and sustainable digital transformation. And translated to development, it means that we promote a vision for global digital governance that supports the interests of countries with emerging and developing economies. In our new paper that we're launching today, um, some of you may have received it by email, those who registered early, and the rest you can for the rest of you, you can see it on our website. It's it's up today and probably on Connectif's website as well. Um, this uh, paper was written by Geraldine, who's in the call, and by Srikant Muku. And in this paper, the authors explore how these countries with emerging and developing economies can balance innovation and regulation and how they can manage cross-border data flows while maintaining some level of local control over their data. So our panel today will discuss how societies in low and middle income countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America can access the data they produce and put them to good use while avoiding exploitation or repression by domestic actors. After the panel, we will have a Q&A session uh, please use the Q&A function in Zoom, and you can do that throughout the call if you wish, and you can submit your comments or questions that way. And um, please submit your name, or otherwise you can also indicate that you wish to remain anonymous. Please note that this event is, will be, but already is being recorded, and but that private recordings are not permitted. So with that, I would like to introduce our outstanding panel. Um, Unfortunately, we're still waiting for Joanna and we hope that she can still join us from, um, I think she's based in Berlin right now, not in Brazil. Um, but I'll start by introducing Linda, Linda Bonio. Uh, she is the CEO of Lawyers Hub in Nairobi. And Lawyers Hub, is, if I understand this correctly, convenes the Africa Law Tech Association, which Linda also founded. And it promotes sustainable and inclusive tech policy across Africa, across the African continent. Parminder Jeet Singh, who many of you know, the executive director of IT for Change, that's an NDO in India that works on the intersection of technology and social change. And Parminder is an expert on digital trade, uh, issues ranging from digital trade to data commons, and he's an advisor to UN bodies as well as to the Indian government. And um, Joanna, just in time. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right, so I'll just go and introduce Joanna. She is the founder, directress, and creative chaos catalyst, I hope I said that correctly, um, for coding rights in Brazil. And that's an organization that works to expose gender and um, north-south inequalities in tech applications. She's also a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And of course, Geraldine uh, already mentioned, she's co-hosting this with us today, and she's the founder of Connectif and of the Global Innovation Gathering, which I wanted to mention as well, which is a network of change makers around the world. 
and they work together for access to technology and for shaping a less Eurocentric vision of innovation, which is, I think, is going to come up today in this event. And one result of this network was that uh, Geraldine organized the first Republika, which is Europe's largest uh, digital gathering annual meeting in Berlin. And she brought Republika to Accra, Ghana in 2018. So before I hand this over to Geraldine to give us an overview of the ideas in her paper, I would like to start with a little warm up round for all the panelists. Um, because we're talking about a rather clunky, complex topic today, digital sovereignty. And digital sovereignty um, means many different things to many different people. So it's sometimes connected to notions of national security. It can be connected to notions of economic competitiveness or of personal or community rights. And whether you're looking at it from Beijing, Brussels or Washington DC, it can mean many different things. But I would like to know what it means to all of you. And if all of you could give me one quick statement or no more than two sentences, how do you define digital sovereignty? And I'd like to start with Kaminda. Thank you, Sabine. Um, well, digital sovereignty for me. Oh, oh, and Kaminda, I think we lost your audio again. So can see if you can. Can you hear me? Very quietly. Okay, can somebody else start? Meanwhile, I yes, let, let's let's start with Joanna then. <laughs> sure. For me, digital sovereignty has to do also with autonomy, with autonomy to to consent, autonomy to say no, and this no shouldn't mean exclusion. So. It was meant to be just one sentence. Let's all stop here. <laughs> okay, digital sovereignty. Also, Joanna's sound level was not coming across very no. good over here. So I'm just going to repeat what she said, like digital economy, digital autonomy is connected to consent and control over one's data. So it's a very individual race-based definition. Um, Linda, what would you say? What is digital sovereignty? from an individual or a national or a community level? Um, I'm connected to independence. And um, this would be at national level would be for government, at uh, national level would be for citizens, which I think for Africa conflicts a lot when the government actually doesn't represent the power, of the sovereignty of the people. So that went beyond two sentences. Okay. Again, maybe I'm the one having the sound problems. Because I'm not. I do have them too. Everyone yeah. too well. Sorry. Can you hear me now? I, I can hear folks. <laughs> I hope everybody out there can as well. <laughs> okay. Um, so I talked about independence. Um, and connecting it to, you know, the national, you know, government or the individual level, which I think for Africa, the interplay is very different when you have a very strong and sometimes a government that is illegitimate or far removed from the people. Thank you, Linda. And now let's check in on Paminda again. Uh, yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, much yeah. better. Okay. Yes. Okay. So for me, uh, digital sovereignty is rule of law uh, on the digital sphere, as all physical things are subject to rule of law. Uh, the digital has also to be subject to rule of law. Uh, of course, the physical can be bounded easily in a territory, and therefore it's easily subject to territorial law. The digital, it's more difficult to subject to territorial law, but to subject it to territory, uh, subject it to law is what to me is uh, digital sovereignty. All right, these are all good definitions. So I would like to hand it over to Geraldine and ask what is your definition and how does your definition connect to the paper that you just wrote? And um, thank you for giving us a quick overview. Thank you, Sabina. Well, I think we all have um, very co complementary definitions and I'm basically just rephrasing what my fellow panelists, my fellow panelists already said. I think digital sovereignty means that 
that individuals are not treated as data subjects, but that we have the power to control um, individually and collectively what happens with our data in democratic systems of checks and balances, and therefore can ensure that it is not companies or governments that are profiting from our data, but that we ourselves are and, and are doing so on a greater social, um, social level as well. So, as you said, uh, we were commissioned by you to write a paper to look at different aspects of digital development uh, from a global perspective and especially from the perspective of least developing countries. And I'm very happy that Srikant is also here in the meeting with us today and maybe can chime in a little bit later to share some of his thoughts as well. Um, we approached this topic, um, which we decided in collaboration with you from a sort of what's the basics that people need um, and started with um, dealing with current topics around access and um, connectivity. We looked at the different sort of bigger overarching internet models that exist and how um, the sort of power game, the global power structures are divided up between the larger players and what this also means for developing countries and countries who are not part of this global power play in a, in a leading role. And then we really focused down on the topic of data and development, treating this as a core issue that is going to lay out the lines for future development and that we are in a situation today where we really need to set frameworks to make sure that these developments are headed in a direction that again is going to be in the interest of the people and the greater common good and not just in the, in the interest of individual corporations or governments and i think that's what we want to focus on in our discussion here today so um i can keep talking a little bit but i can also hand it back over to you uh, of course i'm very happy to give a little intro of what like the a little summary let's say of some of the outcomes and recommendations we make in the paper yeah please go ahead i think okay. in time if you take two more minutes to give us a quick summary of the main points that i think that's great that would be appreciated Sure, and I'm going to boil it down to a little bit of a perspective of speaking here from a development corporations perspective, because I'm obviously really interested in hearing Paminda's, Linda's and Joanna's perspective um, on data sovereignty and data from, for development. Um, so what I really want to say, just summarizing, is that we believe that we shouldn't be making the same mistakes in the ICC sector that we've been making for decades in other development sectors, which is that we need to not treat people as um, the deliverers of raw data the way, same way we've been exploiting developing countries as the deliverer of raw materials in the last decades. Um, and this is at the moment very much what is happening if we're looking at how infrastructure is built up, if we're looking at the fact that less than 5% of data, 5% of data centers are located in Africa or South America um, globally. And, and the way that the sort of drawing up of these, um, of the cake, is, as we can say, in terms of data and that feeding um, systems like AI systems, so data being the cake for sort of broader technologies, is currently happening at the moment. Um, not just for your stu this study that we did together, but a other study that we recently got to conduct on behalf of the German Ministry of Education and Research showed uh, the same infrastructure when it comes to research and innovation infrastructure in Africa. Um, so for instance, data uh, repositories for researchers being hosted outside of the continent, there being very little research infrastructure. We all know the situation about patents, et cetera. So we can see this really um, very uh, clearly in, in the way that things are working today. This is why we feel that we need to step up our game in terms of collaboration to create a better power uh, distribution and also a better setup for developing countries to have this agency, this digital sovereignty as we just defined it in our group. Um, so um, yeah, cooperation can, for instance, in future include, um, include creating space for experimentation and different ways of technical assistance than we have been doing it in the past. It can include coming up with things like regulatory sandboxes. Linda and I just had a panel last week with members of the German parliament where she was calling out to them to really come together when it comes to designing future-oriented policies and seeing this as a joint endeavor, endeavor that we can share in, uh, especially when it comes to designing human rights-oriented uh, data governance plans. Um, so we believe that whilst we're busy in Europe as well, coming up with new guidelines, new ways of doing things, new policies, that this can be a collaborative effort between stakeholders. 
not a panel, not any session goes by where I sit with German politicians or European politicians for that matter, who speak about the European third model that we need to come up with to counterbalance the, um, the surveillance economy of the US and the state surveillance system, China, which we also describe in our development models in this paper. However, I always personally feel that these, this leaves out the idea that the rest of the world matters and we are not just in our little isolated bubble in Europe. And especially we're not the, you know, the global monitors of, um, of, of human rights and oriented approaches or, or future oriented policies. So we really need to think about this more of a global endeavor. If we want to come up with a third way, a more democratic, socially oriented, common goods oriented, open source way of, of dealing with things, we need to reach out and think about this in collaboration with other countries, both countries like Taiwan, who are actually doing these things that we're talking about, but also countries um, in, in Africa and South America and, and how we can get there and how we can turn this into life is some of the things I'd love to discuss with you today. Thank you, um, Geraldine. That's great. And um, oh, I just also got an alert. Um, if if people if people folks in the audience want to ask questions, um, I you can always use the Q and A uh, function already starting now if you'd like to do that. But please don't raise your virtual hands because we're not going to be able to see that. That's just one little um, technical um, um, piece of information that I had. Um, well, thanks, Geraldine, and thanks for this passionate call uh, for our collaboration and making sure that we all live in a, in a just uh, digital world where um, uh, data can be also shared in the public and common interest. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear the view from the ground, uh, first of all, um, maybe, maybe the three of you, because you come from very different backgrounds, could very briefly sketch the debates um, sketch out the debates on digital sovereignty in your own countries for our audience. I think that would be very helpful. And um, I'd like to start with, um, with Kenya, with Linda, actually. Is there a debate over digital sovereignty in your country? Uh, where does the Kenyan government stand on that? And where does it draw the line between like open data flows and domestic protecting domestic industries? And what is the role of communities? And um, if you could briefly sketch that out, I know it's a lot to do in a short time. Um, that would that would be very helpful. So we have we know where, what we're talking about actually when it comes to your countries. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much for that. I would, um, I, I read the report um, that you put out and I resonated with a lot of the sentiments um, because I find it very accurate uh, looking at, you know, fast infrastructure, um, you know, across the continent and what big tech companies are doing um, and pointing out the skills gap on the side of government. Um, I think that was, that was really useful and to have this exchange um, that you know, Geraldine had spoken about. I think it was really important. So uh, first, I resonate with, um, and I find the report very accurate um, in the sentiments. And I would want to maybe just paint a picture on you know what's happening you know in Kenya and also across Africa. So um, first, we admit that there's a skills gap. You have members of parliament and policymakers who are trying to grapple. They're grappling with what's this technology, what's data, um, then what's the value of data. And is it a resource for us? And how do we use it? And how do we protect our people? Um, so the, um, the government is mostly listening to big tech companies that are looking to profiteer from data in Africa. And so we haven't really got to a point where we can stamp and say that we are working towards digital sovereignty for our specific countries. So about localization um, of data, I would maybe um, refer to a few, a few, a few comments. Um, Kenya has a privacy law. Um, and the law in Kenya does not allow you to commercialize data at this particular point. What it says is that the government would in future come up with regulations that will look at you know, um, commercializing the use of data. We know there's still data markets within East Africa, you know, um, but um, the government would you know, say no until they figure out exactly, or until they're done you know, having deals with big tech companies, for instance. Um, the second thing is, if you look at Nigeria, for example, Nigeria has a draft data protection law, um, and this data protection law um, indicates that the data belonging to Nigerians must remain in their country, and so we don't have this free flow, of, you know, um, of data across across the, um, you know, for their citizens. 
Kenya now is uh, negotiating a new trade deal with the United States. And one of the conditions is that free flow of data um, and intellectual property rights as well, which um, you know, critics are finding very punitive um, to, to the country. They don't, they don't see this as beneficial to us. The negotiations, negotiations are still ongoing until next year, um, but we, we feel that um, there must be you know, some sort of bridging the gap between what, what's in it for us as, as a country, is there a benefit for the use of data? Um, on just the data commons, I think that we haven't got to that conversation. We haven't had a critical mass engaging in that particular conversation. The conversations are very in bubbles. Um, we're not going out to speak to policymakers as much um, to indicate to them that you know we could benefit from data. I like the example in the report um, on even traffic data, that, that just by sharing data um, you know, um, with even local companies, it means that startups benefit from, you know, data, they build better companies, and then we can talk about issues of market dominance and be able to go against or compete against the big tech companies. So I think the conversation is still lacking in the continent and um, South Africa has tried, we still haven't got to a, a really great level of having data discussions. Mauritius within the continent and Ghana have also been at the forefront on privacy, but we haven't focused our attention on um, just uh, uh, let's not be nationalistic. Can we look at a broader picture across the African continent um, and come up with um, a serious data intervention? Smart Africa, which is a combination of states, um, and this is mentioned in the report just recently, I think two weeks ago, uh, they came up with a coalition and now they're looking at how to work with the African Union um, and have, I think they're doing a class or a fellowship for policymakers to figure out data and data governance. I think that's a step in the right direction. More still needs to be done. And I think more resources needs to be channeled in that particular direction. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. That's a very good overview, not just over uh, Kenya, but also what's going on or not going on in Africa uh, across the continent. That's very helpful. Thank you. And I think we could probably also uh, perhaps talk about the Kenya-US uh, trade agreement a bit more later if we have the time. Um, I would like to hand over to um, Parminder, who represents a country that has had very active debates over uh, issues uh, of digital sovereignty. And India is also a country that's kind of in between a um, emerging developing economy, but also has its own uh, big tech industry and tech monopolies and um, what is their role and um, what is, yeah, what is the Indian, how has the debate in India evolved over the last years? Because it's also evolved quite a bit from what I understand, Parminder. Yeah, it, it is uh, actually raging in India, both in civil society and government spaces. Uh, and I go back to the definitions which different panelists offered, uh, some definitions went more towards the personal uh, and others were more uh, towards uh, larger organized entities, whether it is a national uh, government or a global system. Uh, and so the problem is that if you stick to a very individualistic uh, view of data uh, sovereignty and data governance, the problem uh, is twofold. That one individual is never strong enough herself to deal with the big power of the big tech and therefore generally the things do not work for her. Second is that data itself is such an entity that increasingly data works in aggregates. Its power comes through aggregation and not individual piece of data uh, normally may not be as, uh, as useful though it is useful uh, for targeting. So in both ways, we need a larger entity which has the power to deal with aggregates of data. But then on the other side is the national government and immediately we get start getting these visions of data authoritarianism, social credit systems uh, and such uh, where the government concentrates too much power because they have the control of data. So very interestingly, therefore, India reached a notion in between the individual and the national government, which is community data. Now community data is an innovation which Indian government started it started with the e-commerce policy of uh, two years back, uh, which introduced the subject of uh, community data. I was a member of that task force which developed that and was large, the concept community data was largely uh, introduced by IT for change into the discourse, if I may say so. Uh, and government of India's draft e-commerce policy talks about community data. Uh, a recent uh, committee on non-personal data, again, of which I am also a member, 
has gone much further and elaborated what community data means. And this report, which is in the public domain now, it's a draft report for public consultation, actually lays out the data commons. Uh, it, it defines community data as anonymized data of large number of users or data which comes from natural spaces or from public spaces. And it creates, a, and it's asked for a law to be instituted, which creates a commons property right in such common data. It is very important that a lot of people talk about mandated data sharing, including the Europe, but data is a very, uh, a very valuable resource. And normally you can't ask a private party to share their valuable resources unless you have a strong backing of law of the strength of property law or a commons law, which is a proper, common property law. Uh, therefore, this report talks about having a law which institutes communities ownership over this commons data. And then it goes further and also says which kind of data is compulsory to be shared, which is the raw data. And if a value add is made by a company over that raw data, then there are increasing, uh, increasing uh, rights of the company over that data. If the value add is very little, then it has to be shared on a friend basis, which is fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory basis. If the value add is a little more, then it has to be brought to a market and so on. So it lays down a complete political economy of, of data commons, which I think is completely uh, a, a very innovative approach uh, and uh, is the future uh, I understand. EU has uh, promised a data act by next year. And we expect EU also may not, it may not go as far as a Southern country like India because the political economy of South is different from a political economy view from the Europe, which is after all uh, still a set of rich countries uh, is going to go in some kind of compulsory data sharing regime. So that data commons as community data is emerging in India. And if I add a little more, because digital sovereignty is not only data sovereignty, but sovereignty over larger digital systems as well. And there is another policy, which I'll just mention uh, within uh, half a minute, which is national open digital ecosystems node, whereby government would have public anchors of health digital ecosystem education ecosystem, agriculture ecosystems, rather than these ecosystems being anchored around a Google or an Apple or Amazon, they will be anchored around a public entity, which would have an open system where private actors can share their data, share their digital uh, um, resources and do businesses. And therefore all these ecosystems would be open and publicly anchored. So these two policies, the node policy and the community data policies are two discussions which are very innovating, innovative and going, uh, going on in India. And I think there's much for us to cross learn from Europe and from uh, developing countries. Thank you, Sabin. Oh. Thank you, Parminder. So yeah, as we can see, the discussion in India is very advanced and Parminder is in the middle of it. Um, very good also to remind us that we're not just talking about personal data here, we're talking about non-personal data as well when it comes to um, value uh, created from data. And also um, very interesting, um, thank you for adding to your definition of digital sovereignty that it's actually not just about sovereignty over data, but also over the entire digital ecosystems and this is something that most many regions in the world are trying to accomplish one way or the other. Um, Joanna, where where is the debate in Brazil going? And um, that's because Brazil has also been very early on involved in all discussions on internet governance and um, but mm -hmm. oh, Brazil also has a lot of domestic um, squabbles, I would say. So I would be curious to hear more about that. Sure. Is my sound better now? It's yes. Good. yes, we can hear Perfect. you hear very well. Okay, so I'll complexify a little bit what I uh, said about consent, because I actually don't see that from an individual perspective. Me and my colleagues- Joanna, you should see... still try to speak up a little though, because- still... Like this? Yes. Yeah. Better. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah. Perfect. me and my colleague, I'll try to complexify a little bit uh, my understanding of sovereignty and uh, what I said about consent, I don't think it should be seen. And that's one of the problems that's being seen 
uh, from neoliberal approaches to data as an individual uh, decision. But uh, me and my colleague Paz Peña from Chile, we wrote an article uh, in which we bring the debates from feminist theories around consent to our bodies and to enlighten the debate of consent in data protection legislations. And in that sense, Sara Ahmed says uh, about the, an intersectional approach towards the impossibility of saying no. She says that you can only consent if you can say no. Uh, if, you, if there is this impossibility of saying no, there is this experience of being subordinate, deemed lower of a lower rank. So you could, uh, could be understood, as, it could be understood as being deprived of no. To be deprived of no is to be determined by another's will. So to think about consent and, and the way we are consenting to our data, uh, it's always under a power dynamic. And by now, as we consent to terms of services by clicking on agree buttons, it's more like an obey than an agree, because if you disagree, you will suffer some sort of digital exclusion. By then, you by that you are deprived of no. So with this article, we are problematizing the notion of consent on data protection as an individual notion and bringing it all together with other feminist theorists, theorists uh, the notion that we need to have a collective notion of consent. And by, only by then we will have autonomy and sovereignty. Uh, when I hear the, the word data sovereignty, um, for me it's problematic because sovereignty is connected to a state by definition. I know we have different kinds of definitions, but that it was how it was shaped in Brazil well, back in time when we are debating the Marcos review of internet, which is now like our constitution for the internet. And under the debate of data sovereignty, uh, one of the solutions was, okay, the state needs to have access to the databases of those American companies that are providing services for us. So we, you all, all those companies need to locate your databases also in Brazil. So there was this debate during the, the draft bills. Uh, by the end, it was taking off the legislation. So we don't have mandatory uh, data localization, but that's how sovereignty was used. So uh, I, I think we need to think or, or be careful uh, with the concept of sovereignty when it means one state fighting with another and individuals will be always uh, subjected to either the power dynamics towards the national, the national states or the international uh, politics or other states. So that was tricky for us because you see, ah, yeah, if you want sovereignty, but then if you see now, Brazil is under Bolsonaro government. We were debating a data protection legislation for years, which got approved. We were in the vacation, vacation ledges uh, for a few years, and there was debates on either it was going to be postponed for, for the law to be effective. Uh, now it's effective since August, still sanctions are not in place, but even though we approved that bill, there was a decree that was an um, executive decree that was uh, approved last year, at the end of last year, to increase um, data sharing among uh, governmental institutions. So, and it has a complete different definitions from the data protection legislation in Brazil that is um, uh, comparable or coherent with 
uh, the GDPR. But this decree allows for integrating databases more and more, and it's in progress. We are going to launch a report about that soon. But basically, under the narrative of innovation, of um, increasing the responses of the state, of efficiency, we are creating a mega database of all Brazilian citizens. Uh, it's going to be integrated with the CPF, our ID, I think it has some inspirations with the ADAR um, experience in India, Parminder. And that's an experiment in which uh, the Brazilian government is using its sovereignty over citizens' data. So how, how do we balance this and have <clears throat> citizens and the collective in the forefront of this sovereignty on top of states and not a fight with states either for, for our data, either the big tech monopolies or the national states to control the citizens. I think this is one of the key questions that I pose to the concept of sovereignty. Thanks. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah, you yeah, added a lot to this very complex uh, definition that we're trying to undertake here. And you also already touched upon also the risks of um, having, you know, where's the balance between communities and governments. And um, you touched upon, um, yeah, in the, uh, Brazil's uh, contra slightly contradictory laws. On the one hand, the data protection law is now in force. On the other hand, there are other um, less laws I also think of the fake news law that they recently passed, and there are other laws that are not as protective of uh, citizens' rights, perhaps, um, including that data sharing, that broad data sharing um, uh, law. And you also mentioned India's Aadhaar program in that, in that context. Um, is that something you would like to comment on, Parminder? Because that also seems, in India, we also seem to see two trends. One is the government trying to really um, um, have um, control over data at a national level. And on the other hand, we have these very um, distinguished, uh, di differentiated debates over community control. Um, would you like to comment on that real quick or? Um, yeah, I can. I mean, I absolutely agree with Joanna that actually the problem is that we are fighting on many fronts. And this, the struggle is simultaneous. One is the political and civil rights front. Another is the social and economic rights front. Uh, we need to have a nuance. And this is an old thing we have seen in developing countries. We would go in favor of our government for uh, on uh, access to knowledge issues, uh, IP issues, access to health issues, and against our governments on human rights issues, et cetera. Uh, and, and I think that problem has become more uh, kind of uh, expanded in the digital sphere. So Aadhaar is being, of course, used by the government to... Uh, have a single point of collection of all aspects of a citizen's life and which is very, very dangerous. And almost all countries are in some or the other way going towards uh, some form of the social credit scoring system of China, whether it's in a, uh, you know, just a financial part or it's in welfare service delivery part, but you can always see that it's becoming that kind of, kind of a system. But on the other hand, we cannot postpone our economic struggles about economic rights over uh, data, where uh, communities and trusts are what we are suggesting. But like with rights, state is always the backstopper. The rights are meaningless if you don't have a backstopper for your rights. That's the state. Uh, and in the same way, economic rights and community data also needs a backstopper. So there is this dual fight, and yeah, and we have to keep it in the balance. Yeah, that is a that is a dilemma that uh, that many countries are facing, but um, especially some of the countries we are uh, talking about today. Before I would like to open this to the Q and A soon because we already have some questions coming in. Um, but I would like to do one last round where you, um, because you've now told us about the situation and the discussion within your countries and regions, but I would also like to encourage you to maybe each say one 
um, make one statement or have one um, observation on what you think the global community has to do and uh, what would you expect from the EU, from the US, um, in, in especially when it comes to digital trade. Um, uh, Geraldine has already um, touched upon these issues by saying that there has to be more um, a collective effort on which data should be shared in the public interest and which shouldn't. But um, yeah, so could you all say something about what your regions need um, and what um, the big players should, um, should consider when um, discussing uh, digital sovereignty across national borders? Um, who would like to start? Linda. Um, that's, I think that's a tough question um, <laughs> because I don't think it's an ask. Um, it's maybe an ask to cooperation. How do we, you know, cooperate moving forward? I'd say maybe what we are focusing on at the lawyers hub. One is to look at how do you close the, the skills gap? Uh, when people know what belongs to them, they know their rights, they agitate better. You know, policymakers make better policies as well, policies that are not very punitive, um, you know, to, to, to its citizens. Um, so I think um, one will be to really close the, the skills gap. Um, and two, um, the policy exchange that we've been talking about, um, I feel uh, that Europe has been, you know, um, at the forefront of developing very good um, policies uh, compared to, you know, the rest of Africa and um, the, the sort of the three balancing the, the China and US, I think, I think Europe has, has done a good job and that continental intervention uh, would help if Africa took the same approach where we are not just focusing on nations because data has no, data flows don't have, you know, these borders that we, we have that exist physically. Um, so I think that um, policy exchange would be great. We have you know, headline laws where you have a data privacy law, but it's lacking in implementation in resourcing. And many times it's also just lacking in content because legislators making policies of things they don't know, some they haven't experienced. And also it's not a priority because of the digital divide, which I like that this report begins from there, that do we actually have access to come and now get to, you know, uh, privileged conversations like digital sovereignty, because sometimes it feels like privileged conversation when you're grappling with electricity, you know, um, affording a laptop, you, you know, there's no critical mass of people who actually are agitating for such rights, you know, online. So I think closing that gap would be would be a really great place to start. Good, thank you. Closing the gap, um, Paminder, um, is the EU doing a good job for the rest of the world right now? Okay, I'll come to EU, but I'll take the point of departure again as sovereignty. And I agree that data makes us even more a global, uh, global globalized world than before. And there has to be shared sovereignty, which is a concept which already exists, whereby we have global governance systems where nations give a part of their sovereignty to a global entity. And that's needed even more in digital and data space. But the problem is that North selectively chooses areas of global governance for data and digital, which serves their purpose and does not address the areas which the South has been crying out for. What do I mean by it? Uh, they're happy to talk about human right abuses, which is very, very important. They're happy to talk about privacy at the most right now because EU has become very privacy sensitive, but these are the political and uh, civil side of it. But when we want to talk about economic rights of countries over their data, over their digital infrastructure, and so on. They do not want to talk about economic appropriation. They don't talk about social justice in the digital area as if it is somehow automatic by just getting connected. That doesn't happen like that. So we need to have a global governance framework which talks about economic rights, economic ownership. Also, on the economic side, instead of talking about genuinely holistic governance frameworks, they want to put everything to WTO. A WTO is not a, a, a real a rules maker. It's basically a rules staller. It says there should be no national rules. That's the basic uh, format. There should be open flow of data, open flow of technologies. Basically, it preempts uh, developing countries to make their own regulatory and policy systems. So basically, it doesn't make law. It basically anticipates uh, making digital law. So I think this is unfair. They should agree to a 
holistic approach to economic, social, cultural, human rights issue. And we should have a, a global body of digital governance, which Joanna at least knows that it for change has been struggling for, uh, uh, for a long time. And it is time that we agree that I cannot ask you to talk about uh, censorship, but I will not talk about economic justice. Both have to be talked together and we need to get to a framework where we accept the economic rights, the digital colonization as a concept and ready to talk about it at least. And then other side also talks about the issues which the North is ready to talk about globally. Thank you, Parminder. Um, I'm going to, I've, I've, with a look to the time, I was wondering if we should go into the Q&A, unless you want to add something directly to this, Joanna, then I would, um, then I would give you the time to do that. Um, otherwise, because we do have some questions, um, I think maybe this is the time to hand it over to our audience at this point, right? Um, I would like to hand the Q&A to our communications director, Carl Roberts who has been monitoring the questions and um, who will lead this part of the discussion. Yes, hi everyone. Um, this has been a really wonderful discussion and I'm looking forward to getting into some questions. So um, for time's sake, I think we can just jump right into it. Um, I think we can start with a question. Uh, for you, Parminder, that builds a bit off what you were just talking about. Um, could you, this question is from an Amazon, the person whose data is being used. Carl, I think your audio was cutting out a bit. Um, I, Parminder, did you understand everything? Actually, I can't read the question. Somehow that part is getting cut. The question to me, I can see that. Some of that part is getting cut Hello? and somebody can read it out for me. I can read it out again, if you can hear me well. It says, yeah. could you elaborate upon the concept of economic ownership and how would this be exercised by data principles? What sort of economic benefits can be trickled down and shared with the data principle? Uh, this goes to the example which Geraldine's paper also gives about the traffic data uh, of a city. The question we have to ask is if I'm sitting in New Delhi or uh, Linda is in uh, Nairobi. Uh, as people from Nairobi go, go around in their cars in Nairobi, they generate a lot of useful economic resource of traffic data. Density of traffic, speed of traffic, pollution data, all of them are collectively generated resource. Now this resource, which is collectively generated, should belong to that collective of Nairobi citizens or commuters, or it should belong to anybody who collects it which is perhaps Google or Uber. And that's the question. And if it should belong to city of Nairobi, then city of Nairobi can together set up some transport, uh, citizens transport body or something, which can say that we will share this data with domestic operators of taxis, uh, ride hailing companies, which are domestic, or on the conditions that these kind of public interests are met. This is true of transportation, this is true of food delivery companies, this is true of agriculture companies. Now let's, let's say a drone moves over a territory and takes pictures of farmers land. And there's a lot of valuable data, even in the pictures, the health of the soil, the health of the crop, what situation the crop is in, et cetera, et cetera. Who owns the data? Do the farmers own the data or the drone owner owns the data? And these are the questions. And if the farmer owns the data, there are farmer collectives in Netherlands and in the US who together negotiate their collective data with those who collect it and then gain a lot of uh, beneficial terms. So I think these kind of community data approaches can be used. Thank you. Thank you, Parminder. Um, the next question is for Linda. Um, it's from Kim Aurora. Um, she'd like to ask if you could give us a brief overview on the debate in Kenya regarding data sharing. How is data generated in Kenya being employed for the community and communities within the country? And what are some of the suggestions from civil society there regarding the same to suit local needs? Thank you for that question. Um, I'd want to say uh, the data privacy law in Kenya is pretty new. It came into force uh, last year in November 2019. Um, and 
it came as a, you know, um, a, a court process. We had the digital ID uh, introduced in Kenya. Uh, it's called Huduma Number, uh, just as we have uh, that in, in India. And so civil society took government to court, indicating that you, they were not uh, supposed to implement a digital ID system without a data protection law. Um, and so then the government was forced to come up with a data protection law in the middle of the lawsuit um, and then put it out there and came to the court and said, we have actually complied. Um, so that context is important to understand that not much time and thought was given to the final draft of the, of the law. Um, and so a lot of the gaps, including the data sharing uh, provision was left for future law. And so the law indicates, uh, I think at section 50 of the Data Protection Act, indicates that um, government will come up, come up with a data sharing code on how government agencies and the public sector can share data. There's no reference at all to community sharing processes. Um, and we have found this um, approach by the government in Kenya especially um, to always look at uh, you know, legislating new laws from a punitive sort of aspect and not look at you know, maybe economic interest and how communities can assert their economic interest. That's a little bit lacking within the Kenyan context. Um, so at this particular point, there's no law on community data sharing um, and civil society, as I said, is at a really nascent stage in exerting digital rights, you know? And so we haven't had that exerted even within the, the courts. It's, thank you for that great answer, Linda. Um, the next question is out of the chat from Priya Vora. Um, and I think uh, anybody in the panel who feels like they're best positioned to answer this can, can jump in. Um, what kind of international oversight mechanisms do or should exist to encourage cross-border data, data flows? She'd also like to thank Linda for mentioning the Africa Data Leadership Initiative. So um, does anybody, does that jump out to anybody specifically? I know Prime Minister, you had touched on that a bit when you were talking about the WTO, um, but if anybody has a strong opinion on that kind of international oversight and what needs to be done, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, Joanna. Talk a little bit. Yeah. Also connecting to the other uh, points on is Europe doing better? Um, for me, Latin America is being uh, at least from the Latin America point of view, the region is being used as a laboratory for many U.S. companies, European companies, uh, testing their AI systems, uh, things that they wouldn't be able to test uh, in their territories. And that's something that happens. Like, we can be inspired by the... Um, environmental movement as well. We see the many factories that closed in Europe go just go and open in in the South, in countries in the global South. So in a way, Europe is solving its problem, but throwing the problem to other places. So we need to have like a global uh, vision of the pro problem that goes to the environmental issues, but that goes to data as well. And I think that connects to, to what Parminder, Parminder was saying, that we need to debate social economic justice in the, those global uh, forums. Um, and uh, data sharing, so it could be, data sharing instruments could be uh, instrument either to uh, protect, privacy or to expose users' privacy even more. No, In, in Brazil, recently, we just signed agreements with the F FBI to share biometric data, which is sensitive data, with, with the US. This is one kind of data sharing that is very problematic. But as it is for law enforcement reasons, is even outside the, the, the data protection regulation. So how do we address that? How do you address uh, the challenge that beyond devices, our bodies are now also becoming data sources? So facial recognition technologies, uh, even DNA, now with COVID, more kinds of uh, data is being collected about our health. So, and with this perspective of perspective also with data sharing for health and safety. So I think there are many challenges coming ahead in, in this new scenario. 
And as solutions, what I would push for solutions would be for decentralization of that and more transparency, even using technical tools to know where, how to track your data. Can we develop more thinking and more technology about that? If this data is being digitalized, it's, it leaves a trace. Why are you not even uh, talking about those traces of the data sharing? and to have more transparency for the data owners about where it's going and so you can question all that and if those systems are decentralized also there will be less power centralizing on those data so that would be some of my suggestions for part of those problems thanks um, thanks for that, jo Joanna. I know that Geraldine wanted to quickly add something to that as well. Um, and then I think we'll come to Parminder for a comment on oversight mechanisms before we wrap up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that there's a pretty horrific example of data sharing internationally in the paper, um, which is uh, the sharing of Zimbabwean people's faces with the Chinese uh, developers of different AI software. So you could read that up if you like. I don't want to elaborate that now. I just wanted to voice something that I'm thinking about and a concern I have when we come to think about these um, models of data localization and community custodianship that Parminda uh, explained, which is a direction I think we're all thinking in and I see as necessary. I do have a concern because like I work in a global community of fantastic people trying to come up with open source solutions, both in terms of policies and technologies to solve their local development issues. And there's this lopsidedness in the world that we live in already, the way that Western countries have been reaping resources and profiting from data from people in developing countries in the past. And a concern I have is, will we be quicker to set up such systems in uh, countries that are already exploiting developed countries? And what will happen to uh, this idea of the global uh, community and us being able to share things for a global common good as well, which is the sentiment I would love to see inbuilt into these systems, even though it just adds to the complexity in a way. Oh, and maybe I can just say, if we're running out of time, I made a note of the com of the questions in the chat um, and in the uh, the webinar front. I'd be very happy to reach out to people if, if they would like that, um, together with Sri, who's the co-author of the paper, to answer any open questions that are directed at us, of course. And then, Parminder, if you can just comment on oversight mechanisms quickly, and then we'll give it back to you. Yeah. Uh, I think... Uh... It's complex. First of all, we should recognize that data today is not just the information flows of last decade. It's much more than. It's about health systems. It's about agriculture systems. It's about e-commerce. It's about all aspects of our lives, including security and military systems. So we cannot have that way a sectoral approach. And we need to have an integrated global system of, if you are using the word oversight. But I think before we go into oversight, we still have to cross that line of norms development, international norms development before oversight has to take place. And we therefore need to have like a UNESCO or a WH of digital issues. We need to have a global body where discussion starts and norms, normative development start. And those normative developments will open up the possibility of uh, oversight of data flows. Meanwhile, I think uh, countries like uh, African countries among themselves, uh, ASEAN countries like a COVID bubble, they can cooperate with normative uh, congruence among themselves and have what is been called as data spaces. Uh, they can develop uh, cross uh, national data spaces where easy flow of data takes place with the recognition of sovereignty of the country of uh, source of data. So I think it will be a tiered uh, approach. Thank you. All right, then I think I will take over here uh, for a few last words since, we, since we're already coming to the end of this very interesting panel. It would be great to have more time because I've, 
I've learned a lot from this panel and I'd like to explore some of the issues further. So again, like Geraldine said, if there's anything you'd like to discuss with any of us, um, then send us emails and we can all connect you and, and get you in touch. That was the part of the point of this as well. Um, and so my our team at the Heinrich Bell Foundation, Christine and Carl and I, we would all like to thank you for coming and we will keep working on these issues in our program, Data and Development. So we we'll definitely hope to continue this conversation. And before I let you all go, I'd like to hand over to our co-host Geraldine for a few concluding remarks. Um, and then I will let you get on with your day. Thank you so much, Sabina. I also just want to express my thanks to you for having the opportunity to work on this topic together and to my fellow panelists for joining the session today. It's a topic I would really love to continue working on together with all of you. And maybe this is something that we can chat to see how, uh, how, to, how to keep this exchange going. I posted my email and my Twitter handle into the chat. So do like anybody who's participating in this, do please feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, I maybe just want to like bring it back home to my place because we didn't talk about that yet and like leave with a little a bit of an anecdote. I really feel like we need to be bolder and louder and bringing us together in a short forum like this or also all the um, initiatives from IT for Change in the last years to really bring activists and different thinkers together to develop these ideas has been, I feel, really, really important and significant. Um, you would think that, you know, maybe in some places people are getting it, but I live in a city where I regularly get told by politicians that nobody has the understanding or the will to regulate things when it comes to data, to data sovereignty, to data sharing or to data management. And I'm battling the same discussions that we're having globally also on a very local level here. I talk to politicians that say we need this European model, but the idea of building platforms on our own and solutions that actually represent our values and represent us as citizens is completely out of the question and something people don't want to invest money into. So I think we just have to keep pushing harder for these ideas that we're developing and, and these new structures that we want and not get so like into this resignation mode that we find most of our, um, our sadly <laughs> uh, politicians in. So that's just a, a call to action for all of us and a big thanks to, to Heinrich Bell Foundation, to Joanna, to Linda and to Parminda for today's debate and of course everybody who came and attended. All right, thanks everybody and um... Thanks for leaving us with this thought, Geraldine, that it's not just about thinking thinking through national digital sovereignty concepts, but that it's about thinking about digital sovereignty for all of us as global citizens. That is a very nice thought to leave this on. Thank you. Have you have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you, Geraldine. It was a great discussion. Bye everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Christine.